is their chemical process less polluting the traditional pulp? So that goes on, goes to the relevance to the SDGs question. And is it competitive on price and quality? That goes to the business potential question. Um, I, I, super impressive presentation. I just, I just think that those are the key questions for whether this, this uh, project uh, has, you know, potential for me at least. Absolutely, and I think those are, of course, amazing questions um, that hopefully they'll be able to answer in some form or format. Um, did anyone else have any um, comments as well? I mean, Ricky and Dan, you're also welcome to jump in. Well, I just feel that um, it would be nice to have the financials, especially for like um, like POMES, for instance. I didn't see a lot of the financials. It um, looks like a very viable business. And of course, um, there is abundant of um, um, raw materials and the rest of that. It would be nice to have the financials to see how it, how it should be. You know. I'm making uh, written note as well. Philip. Hey. <laughs> Good. Uh, two, I, I think two things. So I, uh, I think same question around the SDGs uh, uh, because it's really about circularity, right? Using waste for as a, um, as a raw material for another industry. That's one. So I think for me, I wanted to understand how that value trickles down to farmers. So in terms of price points, because I would assume these are smallholder farmers. Um, the second uh, point is the predictability of, 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 of that material, uh, because I know from my region and I happen to be an advisor to my government and working also with Ethiopia's Agriculture Transformation Agency is smallholder farmers are unpredictable. So is this raw material predictable and therefore is it sustainable? So that's, those are my two questions. All right, um, I totally agree with that. And my big thing, and it goes back a bit to Darius, it was all about the sustainability of it. It's novel, it's a great novel idea, but in terms of sustainability and scalability, yeah, I think there are still early days. So I'm worried, I'm not worried. My question is, what's the age of the students? Are they undergrads, are they grads? You know, are they exec eds, what are they doing? Because the way we approach that, the learning will be different, right? If they're undergrads, then we need to be a little more hands-on, here's what you can do, how to help you implement it and see through that. If they're grads and working in an incubator, then maybe it's a different approach. You know, who are the expert resources that are there to surround them uh, in developing the, the concept? I can actually try and grab that. I know that perhaps one of the team members just tried to join. I think we lost them again, um, but let me go into my notes here real quick and just see. Okay, so this team is all undergraduate and they are all um, chemical engineering students. Right, so the chemical parts there, but the chemicals also have an impact on the environment. <laughs> so that's what I'm going, you know, the younger guys, the novelty, you know, they're sort of like, you know, way out there in the clouds kind of thing, you know, green big, so we need to encourage and facilitate that. Um, but in terms of the implementation, that's where we get into the trade-offs and the compromises and the sustainability of it becomes uh, more critical. I think I would, I would, I would um, if, if they were here, I would ask them whether they've done a minimum viable product which they have tested on a sample set of customers and therefore gotten feedback as to the viability of the of the of the uh, of the value proposition you know um, sometimes we create solutions looking for problems but more often than not what people relate to and what people will, will patronize is problems for which you have solutions you know, so a minimum viable product and testing this hypothesis on a certain sample size and, and saying that, listen, with the little I have, this is what I've found out. But if I get this $300,000 that I'm asking for, then I can scale it to a factor of say 10 or 15 or 20. And in, in 15 months or 20 months or three years, whatever the case may be, I'll 
then scale it to a scale of my region or my town, and then in five years it will cover my, you know, but I, I don't I didn't see that flow. <clears throat> you all still on that point. Of course, I totally agree. If I was going to be an investor, I would want to see an MVP. My question to Ricky is what um what was our what was how did they understand the expectations of this competition? Was it to come up with a concept uh, or to actually get into uh, you know testing a product in a market? I'm just curious, like what what was the expectation of the teams? Okay, so, I go ahead, yeah. Nicole, uh, Maddie, go ahead. No, 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 no problem. <laughs> Ricky, please uh, jump on me, and I think that um, they're going to try and join here. But the expectation. Uh, Darius is it, how we were advertised is that it was mostly idea based. However, what was um, what a lot of students we recognized from a lot of students is that they already had these businesses started. I mean, some of them even had Gmail accounts for some of their ideas or some of their um, for some of their classes. So I think it depended on um, the, the background of that student. Ricky, I didn't know if you want to respond. Perfect. You're on the ball. I mean, we've advertised it as an idea or concept. It's called the African Business Concept Challenge. So it's more conceptual. That's why it's a little more, you know, out, out there kind of thing than it would be in terms of feasible or scalable or implementable, right? So Austin's advice is perfect then, which is, okay, now go test this thing with potential customers. Absolutely. Uh, and I think Lydia, is. are you here? Oh, I hope, hope she can hear us. Team Thomas. Can you hear us? Let's see here. I think they're still stuck. So um, let's just keep on going until they can respond. <laughs> In that case, Darius, did you want to continue? <laughs> I apologize. No, no, I just was thinking that Austin's advice is exactly the right moment for them to start doing that if they haven't. Absolutely. We know they've, they've got a faculty mentor who's working with them. They don't. Mm. Um, and actually, it's a good point because many of them do, um, except for the two teams today. <laughs> right, because I think we could do a little bit of coaching with them, right? This is more about encouraging them and helping them to to get into the the mindset, right? So getting to testing um, is critical, you know, solving the problem is one thing, uh, making it work, it's a different story. So uh, if we well, have a faculty that can work with them. Well, Philip brought up a really good point that, so um, what's really exciting is that Thunderbird has offered um, their boot camp for all of the top six teams. So all 22 students get to go to boot camp. Um, wow. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. That is amazing. That's, that's great. It's um, valued. Correct me if I'm wrong, Philip. It's valued at a thousand dollars per student, and uh, and it's um, some of these professors that are teaching them have actually taught me. If that tells you, <laughs> I don't know how much of an advertisement that is, but I can <laughs> say that they are incredible professors and they have a lot to give. And I think it's a really great opportunity, and they're guaranteed a certificate. So, if you so it's all free for them. Philip, yes. that's what you're saying. Yes, yes, it's yes, it's it's at no cost. Uh, I've, we've been one note to say free. <laughs> okay, <laughs> <It's> all right. <laughs> hey guys, hey guys, let's all become yeah. undergrads, and we're gonna sneak in there in the back. That's you amazing, Philip. Anything, we're just gonna it's sneak no in on the back side. It's at no cost. But if you think about it, actually, it uh, a, a lot of these things I'm seeing and we're talking about are covered in the in the in the boot camp, right? From, from social media to financial planning, to data analytics, to sustainability, to how to build up, put up a team together, it's all there. So they should, they yeah, should. Nice. And also, okay. I think if there's a way that presentation um, skills can also be added to that, because I see a lot of them have um, very great ideas, but they need to be able to push it forward you know, in a way that um, people can really understand. So I looked closely at the presentation skills and I felt that um, we can actually help them, you know, to do something about that, you know, so that would be part of it, you know. And then of course, pitch decks and the rest of it, they need to be able to know that. Absolutely. And that's actually part of the component of, unfortunately, the scorecard, as you could see, but we're yeah. making the most of it. Um, Anil, did you want um, to say anything? Or a sheepy? Oh, 
I cannot hear you. Can anyone else hear anyone? No. Oh gosh. Let's see here. Still Say that again, Anil. Oh. Let's see here. Well, let's see. Is Lydia did not respond yet. While he's working on that, Ashifi, did you want to say anything? Yeah, just two quick points. No. Go, ahead. Um, go, ahead, go ahead. I was just responding okay. to, uh, to Anil. Got it, got it. Um, one was the, the 360 degree um, assessment on the sustainability standpoint. So I saw it, they take a ton of material, raw material, and half of it ends up as the final product. What happens to the other half? Uh, and to the point about chemicals and so on, it's just curious um, to, to see what the full analysis looks like. So it's not just another paper mill with you know, using different materials, but with the same kind of systemic issues that a paper mill may have. Um, and then the second one was on the, on the presentation, like Neriti uh, pointed out, um, they could do so much more with pictures to show how it goes from raw material. I kind of have to dig through to eventually see what they were trying to show uh, and it's not really hard work but just some advice would would go a long way to to help them uh, get the story out more uh, successfully i think that's a really great point and actually something i was thinking about too where does that other material go um anil let's try you again <laughs> we still cannot hear you oh no Perhaps if you want to type something up or get some headphones. Yeah, that, that, that sounds good. Um, let's see here. Peter, I see you're back. Can you hear us? Yes, I'm just settling down in, I are. think. Yeah, gone through the traffic. So I'm just quickly trying. So it's a good thing that they are not in anyway. It's to my advantage. Well, if you would like to. <laughs> say anything as well um we uh the floor is is open as well okay so i was listening in i think there are two um basic issues uh from my point of view uh the first one of course a lot of people echoed it and that's the issue of sustainability um secondly i struggle with the presentation um i think there is a way in which um, we could also help uh, them in ensuring that they are able to communicate their message very well. I think it's a great idea, but my challenge also is that um, what happens to the, to the waste? Uh, we do a lot of work around circularity these days, and, and that pops up in my head very quickly that once you have a waste, there must be something else you will do with it. Otherwise, then you are adding to the problem of the of the environment. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And um, just to reiterate what Anil has said, um, if anyone wants to comment on that, the supply side should be uh, clarified as it is always one of the challenges in circular economy operations. Don't know if anyone would like to respond to that. Um, come. <laughs> from 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 one educator to another um dan um i know you're not required to say anything but i don't know if you wanted to jump in you're good <laughs> i think you're on mute <laughs> yeah I, I i actually thought by the time i got to the mute button you had let me off the hook i don't have okay, no worries then. Yeah. Um, I had a similar question about the process. I didn't feel like I knew enough about the process. Thanks. You know, of course. I am um, emailing the other team ahead of time just to make sure that they can log in in advance. Um, Maddie, I got a question for you. Sorry? Okay. Yeah. So I don't know who jumped in. Ricky, go ahead. Okay. Sorry. I was going to say, how do we structure the feedback? Is Who's going to take the lead? You're taking the lead? You know, let's sort of... So how... On a protocol? How I usually do this is I give anonymous feedback based on the comments that were included in the scorecards. Um, I'm happy to take suggestions, though, if you would like to provide feedback in another way. Um, Ricky, I can give you a scorecard, too, since you're here and we'd love to have you. But um, nice. this will also be obviously provided to the team this recording um, and hopefully that they can you know, respond as they will. But that's usually how that 
um, is providing. Okay. okay, thank you. Go ahead, Darius. Um, no, I was just going to say, I was a question to Philip about the boot camp. I assume that you guys do something uh, around helping them understand how to calculate the unit economics of their idea. Um, but I, but I, I don't want to lose this other important comment. I don't remember who said it, which is in you know understanding the supply chain and understanding what value goes to the farmers in the in that in the calculation of the unit economics would be really interesting. So, um, and then the one other comment I had, which I wrote in my in my scoring sheet, is they don't actually do a great job of explaining the problem. You know, is, there, is it the a, a lack of sustainability of using traditional wood pulp in the Ethiopian context? Is that the, is the pollution, the chemical problem? Is it that they're trying to help farmers? I mean, I just think it would be really great for them to have a very clear and compelling problem statement right up front. Um, I think I inf we infer what problems they're trying to solve, but they're not really clear. And I would make this more powerful if we understood that. And Darius, to that point, I think there's a little bit of a handicap with Peaks because in the Peaks uh, platform, the initial problem statement, there's a limitation in the number of characters. So it takes a little bit of skill to write it up and then go back and extract the essential uh, information to put in there, right? So to their credit, there's perhaps a limitation. And given that they're young, it's probably the first yeah. time, you know, they haven't been around this, uh, been to this rodeo before, so they don't really yeah. know a lot of it. So, you know, I see this as more of a learning journey for them, right? Yeah, totally. And it's one of the handicaps we've got with Pete. You've got a yeah. severe and, limitation on how you Yeah, and that's, that. I mean, and I gave my comment in the spirit of, you know, here's what to think about next, as opposed to a critique of their thing. I. Agree, and actually, just on the problem statement, that's a huge component of um, the Humlog challenge too, which we are now changing to a social logistics challenge. We're working on that um, as well. But yes, Dan has Dan has always emphasized the problem statement as being a crucial component for these student idea developments, and I think that that is what gets them further um, as they develop their concepts. So, I think that's a great point. 